Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. It is February, and I have my guest Mindy here with me today. Mindy has been with us before, and today she and I are going to focus on one of our favorite topics, which is historical fiction. Yes. Yeah. Because I think you like you like to read nonfiction as well, but you also enjoy a good fiction book about history and different time periods. Yes. So yeah. I do like the historical fiction books, although some of the fic- nonfiction books I've read recently, I nitpicked them, and <laughs> I'm, I could make a pretty strong argument that they should be considered historical fiction. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, one of my biggest compliments when I read a historical fiction, if it makes me start researching what yes. really happened in the book. So I do have one that I really like today, and the other ones are, are both enjoyable. So no, no, uh, no bad ones for me today. <laughs> I hope. So do you want to start with your first one, Mindy? Sure. So I unintentionally read three not three historical fiction books that pretty much focused on witches for some reason. So I don't know if there's something subconsciously going on there with my reading tastes. But the first book that I want to talk about is The Hour of the Witch by Chris Bajalian. And it's 400 pages set um, in Boston in the 1660s. And it's about a Puritan woman who's attempting to divorce her husband for cruelty. And I got really into it. And Mm -hmm. then I did um, what you mentioned earlier about researching. And I skipped to the end of the book and I was like, oh, he talked to a Vermont law professor about early New England court cases and where he had based all his research from. And I got more interested in his research than I did in the story itself. Oh, I love a good author's note. Oh, exactly. And I love when they thank the librarians that help them with their research. It's so rewarding to hear that. So that was really nice. But to go into the Hour of the Witch a little bit more, um, it's a 20-something woman who's married to an older man who is very abusive to her, but he's also very um, sneaky about it. So he makes sure that there's no witnesses. They have an indentured servant living with them, and she never sees anything. The man has an an adult daughter from an earlier marriage, Mm -hmm. and she never sees anything either. Um, But he finally goes too far and stabs his wife in the back of the hand with a fork. And it was interesting and that the whole community was more upset about the fact that she had forks in her house because they called it the devil's tines. Oh, my Yes. So that was the last straw for her. She happened to have parents who lived in the same community as her, and they were very supportive of her leaving her husband. And I couldn't help but think what her experience would have been like if it had just been her without wealthy parents backing her up to leave this man. Oh, definitely, because most of the time they wouldn't, you know. Yeah, and I don't want to give too much away, but the trial went from a case of trying to divorce her husband based on cruelty to her being accused of witchcraft, centered around having forks. So, yeah. <laughs> but it was interesting, and, and I do want to look into um, the whole court process a bit more, what what those court cases looked like and what the outcomes were. So, It be- sounds like it would have like some good book club traction am mm-hmm. i wrong are a lot of things to discuss in in the book or i did notice a lot of um there's book discussion kits okay of it with this one so yeah i do think it's a good book discussion all right i might have to book add that group. to my one of my many list of book discussion hopefuls so. oh yes there's all kinds of interesting angles you can take about gender stereotypes and and female independence and yeah okay yeah so sounds good it's worth a read All right. Well, I'm going to go a little bit more modern for my first one. And this is a new book of the month club pick that I had just gotten. It's called Queen of Thieves by BZ Marsh. It is set in London in 1946. So not really World War II, but London was still very much feeling the effects of the war, a lot of shortages, um, a lot of rationing still. I don't think people realize how much people in London suffered after the war mm. was over. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's unusual because in this kind of atmosphere of scarcity, of course, crime people start to fill these gaps, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I have Alice 
Diamond, the Queen of Thieves. She is ruling over her all-female gang. She has a bejeweled fist, so instead of brass knuckles, man, she's going to hit you with her diamonds. Um, <laughs> she also carries a like s- custom switchblade that she names. Uh, she's a pretty scary lady. Oh, sounds very Arya Stark with her needle sword. Oh, yeah. yeah. So... Um, she has developed a network of heisters who wear certain garb and everything and hit the more upscale mm. stores in London. And then, of course, she creates a resale market. Mm. Um, we have one of her new recruits is a young woman named Nell. Mm. Nell is from the slums. She is pregnant. She has a, a boyfriend. But her parents, of course, are very distraught about this. They throw her out of the house. She really doesn't have a lot of alternatives. She was working at a, I believe it was a fur factory, um, but they didn't want an unwed, you know, pregnant woman, you know, working. So she becomes one of Alice's heisters. Well, mm-hmm. Alice also has a code of honor where she wants you to prove her loyalty, and she also wants you under her thumb. Mm-hmm. So as part of this loyalty and getting, making sure that Nell had no other alternatives but to serve her, mm-hmm. she is caught, you know, apprehended for stealing and actually has to spend time in prison so she has the baby, loses the baby oh. because um, she gives it up for adoption because she's oh. pretty much pressured into it. Mm-hmm. But that turns Nell from being a scared little slum girl into having a mission in her own life. And her mission is to go after Alice, the Queen of Diamonds, because she wanted to keep her baby. She oh. decided that she really was, you know, her boyfriend was going to try to do something to make his life turn around. Mm. And she feels like her happy ending was snatched from her. Mm. So it, um, you get to see a lot of the underbelly kind of seediness of London during that time. This was based on a real woman. Uh-huh. So there was a real queen of thieves. I don't know if she had all the attributes of of Alice, but it was still interesting to me that it was based on a real character. Yeah. And there were powerful women in the underworld in London. Um, I don't want to go too much into what happens, but it starts to become a game of cat and mouse with mm. Nell trying to outmaneuver Alice. And Alice has some secrets of her own, which, mm. you know, we come to find out too. So... Um, the way the author set it up, I believe there's going to be a sequel to this book. Mm. I don't know if I'll read the sequel, but I, I did enjoy, it was, you know, a good ride, a good entertaining ride with a, a different time period and, you know, women in different roles than your typical society, Great Britain debutante. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I like the competitive angle that they took, too. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Alice was not a nice woman. No, it doesn't sound like it. No. <laughs> so so what, it, what else do you have? Uh, so the next on my list is um, a book titled Act of Oblivion by Robert Harris. And it's set in New England and England in the 1600s. And it's um, based around a Privy Council member tracking down those who signed the death warrant of Charles the first. And it's also driven by revenge because the man lost his wife and his baby during the glorious revolution. And he is intent on tracking down everybody involved with it. So he's, um, his patron is some Marquis and he has maneuvered himself into a high ranking position and he's pretty fanatical about tracking down these like 50 some people who signed the death warrant, no matter what their role was. Oh, wow. Yeah. And these are, are, they're not Dukes or, you know, that he's tracking down. It's like colonels in the British army. And, um, so two of the colonels escaped to America and, it's interesting in that he has like a code breaker on his Privy Council team and he has this whole cadre of people who are intent on tracking down these people to bring them to justice. 
and justice. And it was pretty sad in that they had about, I think, 10 or 20 people already in prison who they had promised clemency for. And then they ended up um, not going, you know, they went back on their word. (laughs) So that was kind of heartbreaking that these people, you know, trusted the system. Oh, no. Yeah. And threw themselves on the mercy of Charles the Merry Monarch. And yeah. Yeah, so much for that, huh? Really, really um, jarring. It really makes you question like the whole system. So that was, I was not expecting that. And I really want to go back and research this more because I don't know much about this time period because I focus on women's history a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of men's history in here with Charles I being executed and then his son, Charles II coming back and then his brother, the Duke of York. Um, It does bring him in a little bit and his, the scandal with his wife, Anne Hyde, who was the child of, um, Edward Hyde, who is the Lord Chancellor. Okay. And um, so that I found really interesting that they brought that in because there was a scandal. There was a pre-contract or a secret marriage or something. And then James decided he didn't want to marry Anne, but she was already pregnant. And his brother basically made him stick to his word and keep her. And she's the mother of William and, uh, or sorry, she's the mother of Mary and Anne who succeeded James and overthrew their father and all that oh gosh so yeah I was like please tell her story more she's interesting yeah um but it it follows this privy counselor on his fanatical tracking of these two colonels in the new world and um they're trying to like lay low in Cambridge Massachusetts but they're really not because they go to Boston and then they like go to this congregational church and then somebody recognizes them who was in the Battle of Dunbar and was like you took me prisoner and then they almost like busted down this poor preacher's house to get these people out and and then they went on the run and that's about as far as I got because I I kept getting myself sidelined. I'd be like, oh, did this really happen? And I would go look into it, and then I'd go back to it. So 450 pages is a pretty dense book to be doing side research on at the same time. Definitely. Yeah. So, but I recommend it. Overall, Active Oblivion, no idea how accurate it is, but it is an engaging story. Okay. I think you might like my next one. Oh. Um, I am going to 1141 England for this one, and it's called The Siege Winter by Ariana Franklin and her daughter, Samantha Norman, because Ariana Franklin actually passed away when she mm. was probably halfway through this novel. And the one thing I will say is when I read it, you have... There's no, like, delineation. Like, it was very seamless how her daughter took over and finished this book. Wow. Yeah, I was pretty impressed. So this was not a time period that I was really familiar with. Mm -hmm. And if you like strong women, she kind of went at it at the angle, like, she picked two women to really center Mm -hmm. the story around. So... In 1141, England is engulfed in war. It's King Stephen and his cousin, the Empress Matilda, who are vying for the crown. So we have an 11-year-old peasant girl named Emma. And it starts with she is on the run, like she and her family, because the village is going to be burned or something bad is going to happen. Um, And she is kidnapped. So there's kind of like an evil monk who has a thing for redheads. And unfortunately, Emma is red haired. Um, So she, you know, is violated. And then we have an archer. He's one of the mercenaries that has been in the army and he finds her Mm -hmm. and he nurses her back to health. Um, She has pretty much had such a a horrible experience that she's blocked it from her memory. So... He uh, becomes her ward, and she decides that she wants to, like, be a boy, basically. Mm. So she dresses as a boy, and she's young enough that she can get away with this, and Mm. he thinks it would be a safer way for them to travel Mm. than to have, you know, a man traveling with a young girl. So he teaches her how to be an archer, which she ends up being very good at, and Mm. then in their travels one night, they meet a band of three people they are it's a horrible snowstorm they have constructed a small shelter for themselves and these three people come in and one of them is queen matilda oh my god so they get pulled into this whole queen matilda versus um her cousin thing and they end up going to another woman's house who was 
forced to marry someone. Oh gosh, what was her name? I can't figure it out. But um, Maud of Kenilworth. Okay, so poor Maud has been forced into a marriage with a man she cannot abide, and mm. now suddenly her character, her castle has been kind of taken over for this cause. So she is one of the few holdouts for Empress Matilda mm -hmm. in a land where everyone else is starting to go for Stephen. So mm -hmm. you have like big battle scenes, you have these women, you have Matilda trying to figure out what to do with her horrible husband, and on the other hand, help these people. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, luckily her father had taught her to be strong because he had no male heir. Mm -hmm. um, it was all really good. So you get the Civil War, you get, you know, some of these characters, and little by little, you start to figure out who Emma is, really, mm. and what happens to her. And this evil monk is still there, and he's also closing in on this battle because he wants to finish the job because she actually took something from him that oh. was very important. So, so it's kind of like an historical thing, a mystery, a lot of adventure. It has a, this book has a lot in it. We read it for the Historical Book Club on Facebook. Oh, okay. And most of the people were really liked it and mm -hmm. were surprised because not too many of us had been exposed to this time period. So, and I would definitely read another book by, by her or read another book about this time period or mm -hmm. kind of like the earlier history of, mm -hmm. of England. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was really good. The Siege oh. Winter by by Ariana Ariana Norman. <laughs> Did they talk about Queen Matilda um escaping from the castle and how she went about it with like a couple of soldiers? Well, I think that's one she came upon them in the snow because she had yeah. a couple of loyal people with yeah. her and then they had to get her somewhere else and yeah. then they had to spirit her out of the castle where they went to yes. get to where she needed to go for another relative or something that was, you know. And then she ended up walking, I think, several miles and it was dark and she was dressed all in white and so were her, her soldier companions and... It, I just it you can't make this stuff up I love it yeah yeah and she was probably headed toward either her her half brothers or her um her relative Adelaide I think yeah so yeah. but yeah just the thought of of an empress like slipping out the side door of a castle in the middle of a winter night dressed all in white yeah and actually going through the enemy lines like that is just so dramatic right yeah no i definitely think you would like this book i am adding that to my list yes and it is yeah. available on hoopla so you can listen to it Even or better. yeah All right. um if you like audiobooks so yes, without a wait time so excellent that is right up my alley so the last book i'm going to talk about today is hester by laura lico albanese and it's set in Boston in the 1800s, um, centering not one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne. So I'm not really a big Nathaniel Hawthorne fan. I read The Scarlet Letter, disappointed that it was not like the movie with Demi Moore and Gary Oldman. And it was just so dark and so depressing. And just not that the movie was uplifting, uh -huh. but the book was worse it was so sad i love gary oldham as an I, actor he's so versatile yeah. yes i loved him in that movie read the scarlet letter thought it was going to be just as fantastic but it didn't match what a last yeah yes he just he set that bar too high um and I'm not a fan of Nathaniel Hawthorne because of his view on women authors. He was not a fan because they outsold him um, pretty regularly in in the 19th century. The female authors were very popular, and he oh. was not so much. And Jealousy is not a good look on you, Nathaniel. Oh, no. He, no. he was very, very not very embracing of women authors. So, um, But this book is a historical fiction piece about the muse who inspired... The Scarlet Ladder and um, Nathaniel Hawthorne figures in it, and I was I picked it up because I thought it was really going to center mostly on this woman who has um, a gift where she sees colors in letters and sounds, and her mother taught her how to hide it because it was considered risky behavior, and then it kind of parallels 
tells a story about her ancestor, Isabel Gowdy, who I believe is a real person when I read the notes in the back of it, um, who was convicted of witchcraft in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And, um, but they talked about how this gift was passed down through the generations. Sometimes it would skip one. And um, this woman, um, is a, Isabel Gamble, um, became a dressmaker so she could embrace her gift, but also hide it in plain sight, which I thought was really interesting. So, and this is also a book I did not finish because I was like, ugh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. <laughs> He, I did, I did read that one, uh-huh. and he was not a likable character, because they kind of develop a love interest. I just can't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I did like her as a character. Mm-hmm. They also had some other themes in that book too, which um, it parallels the Salem witch trials, right? I, I it believe. was the Salem yeah. witch trials and Hawthorne's horrible guilt, but also. When she comes to this country, this seamstress, Mm -hmm. she's a neighbor to like a black couple Mm -hmm. and their involvement with the Underground Railroad. So you kind of have like two themes going off there. And I love how they they jogged my memory. I loved how they incorporate like the hidden, um, like with the quilts that tell the story of uh, of how to escape. And she gives um, her neighbor a message that yes. she was found out yeah. by sticking her needle in a particular letter. And it was just, that was so clever. And so, like, yeah. I just, I hope if I'm ever in that situation that, like, I will be sharp enough to, like, <laughs> see the word run hidden <laughs> in, like, an elaborate embroidery program. Because I don't think I would pick up on that. I would just no. be like, oh, this is pretty. Yeah. And, no. oh, I would be there as they were bursting down the door, you yeah. know. And I'd be like, what do you mean you warned me? Yeah. I just, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it was it was interesting, but uh yeah, but there were parts of it I didn't like because mm-hmm. I I mainly just didn't like the, you know, Hawthorne was just he was pretty awful in that book. Yeah. Awful person. She seems like a really strong character though. I was yes. all about that that she really put herself out there to to stand up for other people and to protect them and I thought yeah. that was really And amazing. her husband that she came over here with who pretty much left her like he, when he got to New England. Yeah, he was the one in debt, right? Yes. And yet, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Horrible I was guy. Like, Lady, you could do better. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely do better. <laughs> All right. So my last one is called Horse by Geraldine Brooks. Mm-hmm. And this is a book that has one of those two storylines, like a modern storyline, and then one that's set in the past. So <clears throat> the one in the past is set in Kentucky in 1850, and it's the story of uh, he was an enslaved groom, and mm-hmm. he helped a man that raised racehorses, and actually he was a really good trainer. Mm-hmm. So the man decided to give him a horse as as a thank you. But the thing was, is if you were a black man, you couldn't race your own horse. Like you couldn't own and race a horse. Mm -hmm. So they did it like under the ruse that it was still his horse. But supposedly there was this understanding that, you know, it was the groomsman's horse. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. we all know how how that goes, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. for people of color back in that day. Mm -hmm. Um, So the horse became a very famous horse called Lexington. Mm -hmm. That is, if you've ever seen any of the Lexington or Kentucky travel brochures, it's like a little blue horse that's on all these emblems. It's that horse. No kidding. Yeah. So this was based on a a real horse. Um, And then we have, like in the 1950s, I guess this actually had like three timelines. There was a painter that painted the horse. So... And then, a, you know, a woman got a hold of a painting and there were several different paintings and then what happened to them. So in any way, in our modern day story, we have um, a young man who is working, I believe, at the Smithsonian and his neighbor, who is very irritating, is like throwing stuff out. Her husband died. So she's mm-hmm. th- throwing stuff out to the curb and he finds this like, icky painting they were smokers i believe and there was like stuff all over it and but it was a a young black man and a horse Mm. so he picked it up and thought you know she didn't want it she put it out with the trash so Mm -hmm. 
So you have all these storylines starting to converge. Like he meets with another person that's working at the Museum of Natural History who is working on the bones of that horse. And then they find out about the portraits of the horse. And of course, there's a modern storyline as well because the the scientist is white and he's black, Mm -hmm. you know, and what their relationship is like and then modern terms and what's happening um, it was it was interesting. Mm-hmm. I like the historical portion because once once the the man gets cheated out of his horse, mm-hmm. there's a, his son was like also helping him in the barn, and he is still enslaved. The son, mm-hmm. so he decides to go with the horse when the man sells him, and he goes to like New Orleans. So you so have- he escapes with the horse. He doesn't really escape. He's oh. he's still a slave, but he wants to go and continue working with the horse. Like he oh, loves his horse. Okay. He slept in the barn, um, and he's trying to keep tabs on what happens to him. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, it was really good. It was. I don't want to give too much away because it's one. It's a comp- not a complicated, but kind of complicated with these three storylines: the the horse, the paintings, and then the modern people that are trying to figure out the mysteries mm-hmm. and what happens to them as a couple. So, once again, a combination of romance, mystery, intrigue, and and history. Mm-hmm. So, um, and having been in Kentucky and seen the horses, I just was. I had to pick up this book. So, mm-hmm. and um, Geraldine Brooks is also like I don't know if you've read any of her other ones. She wrote the Year of Wonders, which was about the plague. Oh, I haven't read that. No. Yeah, so she's a pretty well-known author. Mm-hmm. She might have even won. Yes, yeah, she is a Pulitzer winner. So, wow. yeah, highly recommend. I did read Horse for my book club, but you did. I did, but I had a hard time keeping all the storylines straight. Um, the way they bounced around so much. Yeah. And and I'm I like to read just one storyline at a time, but then it makes it hard to keep track of what happens to when. Um, but I read the end of it with um the author's note and it turns out there's correspondence in the University of Rochester archives about Lexington and mounting his skeleton. Oh, you're kidding. And it's digitally accessible. Oh, so okay. maybe I can drop that link into our Facebook page or something. That, that would, would be, be really cool. Yeah, I think the 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 skeleton itself is actually still at the Smithsonian. Am I correct? Yeah. I I'm not sure where it's living now, but okay. um, when when Lexington died, they consulted Henry Ward, who owned Ward's Natural Science Establishment yes. around here. Yeah, yep, and um, and there's correspondence in the university archives because he was a biology professor at U of R for a number of years. Okay. And they have a big initiative underway there now to digitize and transcribe his correspondence online. And, um, and I looked at the letter and it's not, it's not that hard to read and it's not that long. So, and you can actually really pick out the word Lexington on there. And it's really exciting to see after you read the book horse, right. To hear him talking about mounting the skeleton or, or doing some kind of preservation work on it. So, Oh, that is, yeah. that is too cool. I and here we have a link. local connection. I know, Thank I you, Mindy, it. our genealogy specialist <laughs> here at the library. Oh, and I can connect anything to special collections. <laughs> yes. You, you are great at that. I love it. Well, that's a fun fact to know and tell. It really is. But yeah, that was a great book. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, another one I think would be good for a book club. And I think I'm going to put it on a list for mine to, to vote on. But I think I'm going to look at Year of Wonders, too. That looks like a good yes. book. Yes. I know um, one of our coworkers, Kirsten, really liked that oh, yeah. one. It's not too, like... Oh, this is COVID in the 1300s. No, no, okay, no. <laughs> it was the original time, and it was about a town that chose to isolate themselves. Oh, okay. At that time. And it's not very thick. Uh-huh. So, yeah, very oh. doable. So Sounds like my life goal right now. <laughs> oh, I know. Sometimes you need that. You know, it's like when I look at some of these 400 pages, and I'm like, oh, no, not right now. Yeah, I can take a smaller book once in a while. Yeah. That sounds good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we will be back again soon. I'm going to have another guest and be doing an episode about cozy fantasy. And I'll have some definitions of cozy fantasy for those of you that want to learn. So as always, follow us, like, share, and tell your friends about Book Break. So thanks and see you next time. 
Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.